the peacemaker. Let's turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. This is the Sermon on the Mount, and the word beatitude means blessed. The beatific vision means to be able to see God. That is the most blessed state that we can be in, is to be able to see God. Starting with verse 1 in chapter 5, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into the mountain, and he was set. His disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Blessed are the peacemaker, for they shall be called the children of God. When the universe was void, devoid, and without form, God spoke, and then life happens. When the world languished in darkness, the Word of God, the Son of God, condescended and took on flesh and became the light of hope for us. Today, in the time of unrest and apprehension, families are segmented into ideological silos. The church must emerge from obscurity and bridge this gap. The children of God are called peacemakers. Because we're not on the left, nor are we on the right. We are in the middle. Since the beginning of time, humanity, our society, attempted to make peace. We were never successful. We tried it everywhere. Never successful. The best that we can do is compromise and make some kind of concession. You give me this, I give you that. But then it never lasts. Peacemaking is beyond human understanding. Peacemaking requires us to give up something we are unwilling to give up. Peacemaking requires sacrifice. That's why we can never do this. When you want to make peace, someone needs to pay the price for both sides. That's what peacemaking is. It's not two sides come to compromise on something because it never lasts. The pain and the hurt and the vengeance will always be there until someone take all of that upon himself and die and say, you're all free. Peacemaking requires sacrifice, and we can't do it. How do we end up in this place? How do we lose peace in the first place? Why do we need peacemakers? Today, in this great United States of America, no one is willing to make peace. What would happen to our society? What would happen to our children? What would happen to our future? How are we in this state? Because of some election? Because of an individual? I disagree. It's in our human nature. It built into us. 
Matthew chapter 7, two chapters behind that, verse 21 and 22. This is what Jesus said. From within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, of course, foolishness. From within us. You see, you hear that money or riches corrupt people. I don't believe that. Riches and money is an enabler. What has been dormant in our human nature, the greed, the selfishness, is enabled by the riches that happen to come by. And it brings the ugliness outside. We all have it in us. We can deceive ourselves and think, no, I'm a good person. From within, out of the heart of man proceeds evil thought, Jesus says. When Adam disobeyed God, mankind descended into a self-destructive cycle of violence. You see, at the time, there was no violence. But when he disobeyed God, violence happened. Jesus warned that in the days to come, in Matthew chapter 24, this is in the last day, when people ask what happened in the last day, and this is what he said. Verse 10, And then shall many be offended. And then many shall be offended. Are you offended right now? I see it in your faces. And many of you are offended. Over what? And shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. More than 2,000 years ago, Jesus spoke this. And we're seeing it unfold before our eyes, in our families, in our community. It is built inside of us. It's not something new. It's always reside in there. Just take the right fermentation, and then things like this start to bubble up. We send our children overseas to die in our wars, to fight our battles. And what are we doing at home? The mark of brutality. Expelled from peace and serenity in the Garden of Eden. The mark of Cain reminded humanity the infliction of violence against itself, brother against brother, shedding innocent blood. From that time forward, Cain's mark, the mark that God put on Cain, became the reminder that mankind can no longer live together in peace. The blood of Abel cries out, even in death, we still seek vengeance, don't we? The blood of your brother cries out unto me, God said. And so God had to put a mark on Cain. Wherever he goes, people would not kill him because of vengeance. Something wrong initiated the violence that spread all over humanity. Generations after generation. You hurt me. You kill me. Someone in my family will live to kill you. Vengeance. Even in death, Abel's blood cry out for vengeance. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken upon him sevenfold. You hit me one, I hit you seven times. And the Lord said, a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. From then on, from when the violence began to happen because we disobey God, we spiral down into the cycle of violence and vengeance and violence and vengeance until one day, the blood of one man, the peacemaker, stopped crying out for vengeance for those that he paid for. That's the end. 
That's the end of this journey, cycle of violence. And Paul writes to the Ephesians that by nature, by nature, we are children of wrath. We have the propensity for hatred. When we think about what's going on, we want to know who is to blame, who is responsible, what can be done to punish the evil worker. And God looked at us and he says, how should I save these people? Our survival instincts trump our humanity. Mankind strive to persist at the expense of purpose and meaning. We want to live, we don't know why we're living and for what reason. There's no meaning, there's no purpose to existence. And yet, the unyielding drive to live at the expense, expenditure of peace became the end game for many. Just to survive, because everyone else is, run, is running, so I'm going to run with them. I don't know where everyone's going. Have you been to a Black Friday massacre? What were you there to buy? You don't know. Whatever else people are going for, you're going for that too. There's no meaning, there's no purpose. Paul looked at humanity and included that this is all absurd. Titus chapter 3, verse 3. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lusts and pleasures, living in malice, envy, hateful, and hating one another. James scolded the church and he says that you fight and wars because of your lusts. Like a room full of petulant juveniles without adult supervision, we see here happening in our society. Juvenile, kids, fighting with each other, and we annihilate each other. Paul warns the Galatians, without the Spirit of God, we will destroy ourselves. Galatians chapter 5, verse 15. Heed the word of the Apostle Paul. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. Not only we bite and devour each other in holding on to our canality, we also declare war against our Maker. Paul says in Romans 8 7. That's our condition, that's what we are. Seems dire and hopeless. The time of total and utter hopelessness, God offers an olive branch. The offer of peace. God looked upon our wretched foolishness and He had compassion on us. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. But God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace, you are saved. God, who is rich in mercy. I thank God that He is rich in mercy. I thank God that my God is not some invention that comes from my mind or any other's mind. I thank God that He is altogether different. Whatever that goes through my mind, He's altogether different from all that. But God, who is rich in mercy, look at this mess that we made and had compassion and mercy on us. That's the God that we serve. That's the God that's, that looked at us and says, for His great love wherewith He loved us. When we were dead in our sins, He quickened us together with Christ. By grace, we are saved. Only by grace are we saved. We deserve nothing but what we have received. Our defiance toward God and hatred toward mankind had deprived us from any position in eternal life. We don't have a say. We don't have any merit at all standing before God and say, I deserve that. 
It is all by the grace of God when we were yet undeserved, dead in our trespasses and sin, God had mercy and compassion on us. And we come to God only because He invited us to come by His pure, sovereign grace. He tore the heavens, condescended to our appalling state, and put on our mortality, our flesh, and lived like us, and became the eternal sacrificial lamb. You see, when we are at war with each other and we want to make peace, we look for a scapegoat. We look for someone who we can put the blame on and say, let's all put the blame on that person, that individual, that entity, that organization, so everyone can be at peace with each other. Jesus Christ is that sacrifice lamb where the sin of every human ever committed was put on him and he became the scapegoat for us. Isaiah 53 verse 5 But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The justizement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. Jesus Christ is the offering of God's peace toward us. When we fight and war, kill each other, Jesus Christ came and made peace between us and God. The punishment that brought us peace was upon Him. Another translation. The punishment that brought us peace with God was upon Jesus Christ. He was the scapegoat. It was that in which humanity say, He did it. He did it. Punish Him. The Lord, our Jesus, was the peacemaker because He bore our sin. He bore our shame. Our iniquity was upon Him. We are reconciled through sacrifice. Romans 5 verse 10 For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Church, we are reconciled with God and to God through the chastisement, the punishment of Jesus Christ. That's how we are reconciled. That's how peacemaking happens. Someone took the blame for us. What further evidence of the love that God has made for us? Do we need to see anything else? Only the death of a perfect son of man can reconcile us, reprobate, cast out to a holy God. How can we understand, how can we fathom the depth of His love for us? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We may get a glimpse of it by gazing, staring, looking at the cross of Jesus Christ. That's the only way. When do we do that? When do we look at the cross of Jesus Christ? When do we think about His love for us? When do we gaze upon His holiness? And His love for us. Let us return. Let's find that place beneath the cross. Jeremiah 31.3 Mark this in your digital devices. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore with loving kindness have I drawn thee. This is God's promise. The love of God is without bound. The love of God is without condition. The love of God is without all merit. Jesus died for us. That's it all. Contemplate on that. Think about that. The love of God toward us transcends poetry, songs, lyrics, beauty, and life itself. The peacemaker. 
Coming back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. We don't know peace until we know the peacemaker. We cannot be peacemakers, children of God, until we meet the Son of God. Jesus Christ is the peacemaker. Jesus Christ is the first and last peacemaker. We are the generation that comes from Him. All those who are born in Jesus Christ are sons and daughters of God who would do the peacemaking ministry because Jesus Christ is the peacemaker. Besides Christ, no one has the merit nor the authority to speak about peace. The incarnate Son of God put on flesh to reconcile sinners and a holy God. He justifies us so that we can stand before God and God looked at us through Jesus Christ and say, you are justified because of my son. That's what Jesus did. What can we do? There's nothing we can do. But believe that's what he did for you and I. We believe in the son of God. We believe that he died for us. We believe that he stood in our place. He took on flesh, all flesh, so that the sin, all sin, would be put on him. We believe that, and we declare that. And Jesus Christ performed that work on the cross for us. He is the peacemaker. He reconciles us unto God. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. One mediator between God and man. The peacemaker, mediator, who took man's sin before God's judgment of wrath. We were all condemned sinners, damned to be eternally punished. But he died to make the bridge between the justified sinner. Imagine this, justified sinner. Who can justify a sinner? And a just God. We now have a ministry of peacemaking because Christ, who is our head, the peacemaker, has borne a generation of peacemakers. The world will know that we are children of God not because we are triumphant over our enemies, not because we have better things and more logical explanations of our positions than the other side. We are called children of God because we are peacemakers. Because we took on the same ministry that Jesus Christ did. He made peace. When they came to arrest him, when his enemies came to arrest him, when his friend betrayed him, and Peter took out a sword and cut off the servant's ear. And this is what Jesus says, put your sword back. Put your sword back. I'm not here to fight. I'm not here to war. I'm here to save. I'm here to save you. If I want to. I don't need to meddle in in this. There are legions of angels my father has ready for me. I'm not here to fight with you. I'm not here to quarrel over little trivial things. I'm here to save you from eternal damnation. That's why I'm here. Oh God, his disciples wanted to do what? Draw out a sword. Let's storm the castle. Let's bring down Jerusalem. Let's set up a new government. Jesus, that's not why I'm here. I'm here to bring you together. I'm here to break down the division between man and man and generations, the heathen, the Jews, the Gentiles, the Samaritans. I'm breaking down these barriers. And you wait when I'm on that cross and when the work is finished, I am breaking down the final barrier and that is rending The division between you and God. 
I'm bringing you to God. I'm here to make peace. I'm not here to fight with you. Put your sword away. Put your sword away. I'm not here to fight with you. I'm here to make peace. The world will know that we are children of God because we're here to stand between fractions, between people who hate each other. And we put ourselves in the middle and say, come, what are your disagreements? Let me take them so that you can be reconciled together, so that you can be reconciled to God. Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. Forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye forgive, reconcile, stand in the gap, stand in the middle, be a peacemaker. As Christ reconciled us to himself, let us be as children of God, make peace with each other, make peace with each other. Let's go beyond this, trying to reconcile disputations. And this life is inconsequential. Not making concessions or compromises. We're making long-lasting, eternal peace through Jesus Christ. And all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, has given us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. You, 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 and you, we are all given the ministry of reconciliation. This is our ministry, to reconcile ourselves and to reconcile the world to God. This, my brothers and sisters, let us now move away from the left and let's move away from the right and stand between the sectarian aggressions to reconcile the fallen humanity to God. Let me end today with a song.
by your grace and only by your grace can we come and receive that which you have promised the promise of peace the promise of life the promise of a life beyond the things that we can see touch feel a life that is beyond mere existence and into the place where we look and see people everywhere, different tribes, colors, backgrounds, come together, united in the name of Jesus Christ. Not by our merits, not by the things that we can and will offer, but only by your grace through the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ are we able to come. And so we lift up our voices and say, thank you. Jesus, thank you for the grace and for the love that you have for us. Bring us together now into your family. Let us be peacemaker in this time that the world will know that you have come to bring peace on us. We are grateful to live in a time like this, Lord. There's work to be done. So let your grace be the wind and the song that would carry us to where you have ordained your name to be proclaimed upon our tongues and our lips. May you be glorified now and forever. In the name of Jesus, we all pray.